Welcome to this small lecture on encryption, where I focus on mental models. The content here helps meet two of our course objectives. First of all, it will help you to better identify end user perceptions and common mental models of digital security and privacy, as well as possibly help you identify some design improvements for security and privacy interfaces. Now, in another lecture, I've also talked about this picture and about encryption. And if you haven't viewed that yet, or it's new to you, I'd just like to repeat that encryption helps mitigate against interception threats. It's a process that converts plain text or images, other types of message content, into ciphertext and then back into plain text or other message content. This helps keep our intercepted messages from being understood. And it predates computers, such as the Caesar cipher, which is symmetric and where you shift letters back and forth, but they enable creating better codes. This is essential for the internet. People would not accept this type of distributed network and these types of computing technologies if they did not have some sort of basic guarantees, such as encryption. And the Caesar cipher that I've showed you is an example of what's called symmetric cryptography. Now, I have an illustration here to show you a little bit more of what I mean by that. So for instance, Alice has a message. She has an encryption key, and this is something that she shares with Bob. So that's why it's symmetric. It's mirrored on either side. So once that message gets encrypted with the key, then Bob can use the same key to decrypt it and read it. The advantages are that it's simpler and easier to understand conceptually than asymmetric types of methods. However, the disadvantage, one, is that it requires both sides to have the same key, and that can open up some vulnerabilities as well. So in the digital age, we like to use asymmetric cryptography, and especially this is an illustration of digital signatures. So this type of cryptography, if you look at the diagram, this shows you how we create and verify a digital signature. We're going to calculate a hash code. We're going to encrypt the hash code with a private key of the sender. Now, when people have different types of keys, that means it's asymmetric, it's not the same key. Then in the middle of the diagram, you see now we've digitally signed the document. And then at the receiver end at the bottom, that piece of software will calculate the hash code and decrypt the signature with the public key of the sender. And the note at the bottom says, if the calculated hash code does not match the result of the decrypted signature, either the document was changed after signing, and that's a violation of its integrity, remember our CIA model, or the signature was not generated with the private key of the alleged sender. And so that is a violation also of its confidentiality. And so in short, in this type of signature process, we're using a public key to encrypt and then the private key to decrypt. And I've also talked about PGP in other slides. It's the same basic sort of process. This is used for TLS, SSL, and HTTPS types of transmissions and other secure software. This has actually made everybody's lives a lot more secure as we use Wi-Fi and surf the internet. Web servers and browser clients do what's called the TLS handshake. So in this diagram, you see there's a client, in this case, a laptop. It could also be your phone or other device. And it is talking to a server on the other side of the diagram. So the web server has the public key and it's Oh, actually, excuse me. It is actually the client that has the public key. The client uses the public key and then returns a random symmetric key to the server. And then the server uses the symmetric key to deliver the web page back to the client. And you see this diagram here illustrates more technical details about this process. Usually users don't have to know all that. In fact, we've created um, some interesting types of signals or indicators for users to figure out, 
basically that something like this is running in the background. Remember, we want to make it invisible to users without them having to fully understand everything that's going on. And so in this diagram here, for instance, this shows you different types of indicators that have been displayed through the years on different types of browsers for different sorts of connections, but also to signal in, um, for instance, when there is errors in the process, and then also where malware is detected. And you can see they're using different colors, different types of icons, and also different fonts and different weights of the font. A Google user study led to design improvements for these indicators on the Chrome browser. And I've got a link here to this paper if you want to look it up. Although some of it may be unfamiliar now because the design has evolved, the basic principles will be very interesting to you. And so for instance, here in this image, you see three of the proposed connection security indicators that they tested out. And thinking about our Johnny user or our non-expert or folk user, so can Johnny now encrypt with these types of technologies and indicators that we have created? I would say that current software is much better. Most messaging is successful and maybe isn't being intercepted if, it, if we're under attack. Uh, but also a lot of this takes place automatically. If I use an end-to-end -end encryption piece of software, often I don't have to see anything about it. And in fact, when nothing is visible, users can be unsure of when their messages are encrypted and where it is not. They also end up being unsure of the threat model and the security of the messages. This is a trade-off of making things invisible. It's the idea of out of sight, out of mind. People's mental models will not be well formed. And there unfortunately still are a range of usability issues that can discourage adoption. We'll talk about these more in class. Now, when we think about users' perceptions and mental models, an early study that I have cited here talks about uh, various um, adoption criteria that the researchers derived from interviewing people, surveying people, and figuring out people's mental models of encryption. Some of these mental models are listed here, such as that encryption in a lot of people's minds is used to protect secrets, things you don't want to get out of the organization, this enables them to operate successfully and maintain trust, but that message integrity itself, maybe the signatures that we talked about earlier, maybe that's actually not valued by our non-expert users. A lot of people in the study too thought that going beyond certain limits is paranoid, such as would you really care about encryption if you're emailing your mother? Also, their mental models indicated they thought of encryption as flagging a message as secret. And also related to this, that the decision of whether to do this ends up delegated to the originator of the message. And finally, another mental model they found was that encryption or decryption, this has a serious time cost in people's minds. And so actually socially, Encrypting everything is seen as rude. You're putting a lot of burdens on the person that you're talking to. So another study that followed up on that more recently, um, I like the title, When is a Tree Really a Truck? Exploring Mental Models of Encryption. This described mental models of further how users think encryption actually works in practice. So these mental models include um, that it's primarily used to protect stored data, not messaging, and is used as a form of access control. And further, users do expect that organizations are doing something like this. They feel very betrayed when it's revealed that they're not. Users also think of encryption as transforming data to something else, which isn't really what's happening there, but I can kind of see why they think that. And also most people's mental models, at least at the time of this paper, I suspect it's still true, is that encryption is symmetric. It's the kind of thing you might've done in grade school where you're sharing a secret and you're both sharing the key uh, to encrypt and decrypt the message. Many people do think that it's easy to break encryption and that might be related to the fact that they think it's symmetric. 
And frankly, they're confused over what um, transport layer security, TLS, actually means. Um, I know it is a very complicated process, and so I don't blame them for being confused. Well, the implications of these studies for design and policymaking, first of all, are that when we think about encryption of stored data, that's going to fit better with our users' mental models in general, and there's an easier case to make to them for adoption. What we find is that communication encryption, at least at the time of the studies, did not fit with the users' mental models, and users are less aware of the need for it. And I have seen that some messaging companies would turn on end-to-end -end encryption, but in a very casual way where they're not indicating it to users, but people who really value that still would gravitate to those products. Personal use of encryption is seen as paranoid in many cases. And that's something to consider too. It's not always about in people's minds, what is the technical requirement or functional requirement for security, but there are many social needs. Uh, that surround whether or not people accept and adopt security and privacy practices. And there's another question that has been raised in studies like this and in a lot of discussions about encryption, which is, should we as society want some sort of backdoor in encryption? Uh, for instance, um, we've had discussions as a society about uncrackable or so-called warrant-proof end-to-end encryption in newer apps such as WhatsApp. Authorities sometimes would like the ability to get into communications that are being exchanged by suspects or people who have perpetrated violence. But other people do push back on this because they want to preserve robust encryption for everybody and they see a slippery, slippery slope if authorities reserve some encryption secrets for themselves and they don't allow many people to use very safe encryption. These are also things we can discuss in class, but we won't solve this. This is something you should reflect on because we'll have those policy debates into the future. Thank you for listening. <laughs>